big smile. Good to meet her husband. I think that's the first time I met him. Yeah. Alice. Alice. Okay. Um, I listened to you on Wednesday. Oh, I see it. I usually see uh, June's watching. Yep. Yeah, I, I turn it on at daycare one. Good for you. Yeah, make it real loud so all the kids can hear, right? Well, everybody's nap time. Too. Oh, okay. So I have to keep you got to put your headphones on. <laughs> well.
Well, good morning. It's great to see everyone here this morning. We've got, uh, it's great to have visitors with us this morning. we got several out this morning in the uh, fellowship hall getting ready for the big day for Gracie's bridal shower. I think Hayden might get to benefit from that as well. So we're grateful for this special day for them. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and ask for His help as we worship Him in, in a way that's pleasing to Him. So, Father, we thank You so much for this morning. We thank You for the privilege we have to... Uh, Lord, to come to the realization, God, that we need you, God, that we, uh, God, we don't have all the answers, God, we don't have, uh, we don't even know what tomorrow holds, God, we, God, we're just desperate and needy people, God, if we're real honest with you, but we thank you, God, that you come and rescue sinners, God, we thank you that you uh, are willing to put our sins at the cross and pay for them in totality, God, not just our past sins, but even our present ones, God, we thank you so much that, God, that you are the God of forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of love, and God, that you have loved us eternally through Christ Jesus. And we thank you for the blood that he shed, uh, his innocent blood. And God, we thank you that he went to the cross in our place. God, we thank you that we have uh, the church, God, that we can meet and we can worship you together. God, we can learn from one another. God, we thank you that we can cast our cares on each other and find help in our times of need. And God, find a friend, a true friend in Christ. We thank you so much that you have given us one another, and God, we thank you that you have given us fellowship, true fellowship, and God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit has applied these wonderful truths to our lives, and God, we pray for anyone here today, God, that has yet to recognize you as the lovely one, as the exalted one, God, we pray that you would open up blind eyes to see that, Lord, that that sins are forgiven because of the cross of Jesus Christ, and there's no way to be right with the Father except through the Son, and God, we pray that you would uh, God, you would just shine the gospel of the glory of Christ in, in weak and wounded hearts, God, that you would humble those who are exalted, and God, you would show them they need you. God, we just delight ourselves in the Lord this morning. God, would you fill our hearts with praise and adoration for you? God, would you help us, God, to see you as the altogether lovely one? God, that you would be magnified in our hearts and our minds and on our lips. And Father, would you bless those who will lead us in music this morning? We're grateful for their efforts. We're thankful for their love for you. And God, would the the glory of Christ uh, shine off of our faces? And God, would you anoint us with with power today? And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand with us? Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. My God is slow to anger when I go astray. Bless the Lord, O my soul. For all of my betrayals, He will not repay. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Through mercy and compassion, His great love is proved. He covers my transgressions like the snow as far as east from west are all my sins removed bless the lord oh my soul he saved me from the pit he saved me from the pit when i had lost all hope Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. From endless springs of kindness, all His blessings flow. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Our days will fade, our days will fade like flowers and are quickly spent. And like the wind, our years will come and go. covenant bless the lord oh my soul mercy 
merciful and gracious. We sing this together. Merciful and gracious is my God to me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And we'll sing of His goodness. And I will tell His goodness through eternity. Bless the Lord, O oh my. All creation praises Him. And bless the Lord, you angels, all you heavenly hosts. And every living creature here below. Praise the Father, praise the Son, and Holy Ghost. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And bless the Lord, you angels, all you heavenly hosts. And every living creature here below. and Holy Ghost. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Come thou almighty king. Come thou almighty king. Help us thy name to sing. Help us to praise. Father all glorious or all victorious. Come and reign over us ancient of days. Thou incarnate word. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend, come in thy people bless and give thy word success, spirit of holiness on us descend. All glory be to the Father. All glory be to the Father, all glory be to the Son, all glory be to the Spirit, the Blessed Three in One. Come Holy Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Comforter. Thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour. Thou who almighty art now rule in every heart, and there from us depart, Spirit of power. All glory be to God. All glory be to the Father. All glory be to the Son. Blessed three in one. To thee, great one in three, eternal praises be. Hence evermore, death, where now is thy sting? Crown him the King of kings, we to eternity love and adore. All glory be to the Father, all glory be to the Son, all glory be to the Spirit, the Blessed Three.
Amen. You may be seated. As we continue through this time of worship, we'll take this opportunity to go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us in our worship, ask him to help us fix our hearts, our minds, our desires, and our affections upon his son Christ. So if you would please go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help you in your worship today. First Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Father, we thank you so much for the person and work of your son, Jesus. Father, though we were once lost in darkest night and thought we knew the way, Father, the sin that had promised us joy in life had led us to the grave. Father, we had no hope that you would own rebels to your will. But Father, if you had not loved us first, we would refuse you still. Father, all we have is Christ. Father, whether in abundance or poverty, whether in trials or suffering or temptation, whether any, in any gifting that any of us may possess, good times and bad times, all we have is Christ. For Father, the only reason we can call you Father is through the adoption that we received through the blood of your Son, Christ. And that that blood that Christ spilled on the cross for his people has washed our sins away. And though our sins were once like scarlet, our souls are as white as snow. Not because we are so good, not because we are so worthy, but because Christ is so good and because Christ is so worthy. Worthy, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Thank you so much for Christ. Father, please help us in our worship today as we sing your word, as we pray your word, and as we hear your word preached in a moment, as we take of this table in a moment. Anchor our thoughts, minds, hearts, affections, and desires to Christ. And may we make much of him this morning. We thank you for him. It's in his name and through his blood we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us? We sing, I once was lost. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy in life Had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own A rebel to your will And if you had not loved me first I would refuse you still but as I ran my hellbound
my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so Father, use, oh Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be my only voice is you, hallelujah, hallelujah. just a moment to remind us as we sing about this, that our God is a God of, of inescapable holiness and unapproachable light, who cannot stand the presence of sin, who cannot stand the existence of sin, and he would crush his only son 
in the place of ruin and wretched sinners, that we were once his enemies, and now through Christ Jesus, we are his beloved children. Who could accomplish this work? Only a holy God. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him? That's right. Only a holy God. Only my holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy. else could rescue me? Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only him. Only a holy God. Only my holy God. Amen. Father, we thank you for the work that you have accomplished that we could not. We thank you for the Savior that you have sent for our great need. Father, we thank you that you have crushed your only Son. to secure our redemption, to bear the just, good, right penalty, which is your wrath for sin. Christ drank your cup of wrath down to the dregs. Christ alone on the cross bore an eternity's worth of wrath for all the redeemed. Father, that penalty was mine. That wrath was mine. And yet Christ took it as if it were his own. And not only for me, but for my brothers and my sisters. Truly, Father, our lips shall sing your praises from now till all eternity. And our only response to this wondrous gospel will be to God, be the glory, the honor, and the praise forever. Father, we thank you for your son. And Father, as we take this table, help us marvel all the more at this wondrous, grace, gracious, and merciful gospel that he brings. It's in his name, his mighty precious name, and through his most precious blood, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In our service. Sorry.
my apologies for that. <clears throat> it worked earlier. Uh, I want to say a few things about the supper. One of them is that um, it's, a, it's a time of celebration to give thanks, uh, looking back at what Christ has done for us, that he went to the cross, uh, having done no wrong, innocent in his nature, innocent in his deeds, and uh, he went to the cross to take the place of sinners, uh, people like you and I. So we remember that, and we give thanks for that. And so it symbolizes what Christ has done in our hearts, that he has changed us, and because of his stripes, we can be healed. And because he shed his blood for our sins, we have life. And so we think of the bread, we think of the cup, and we, we think of that. I want to also encourage you that, um, that some churches are different on this, and so you may be wondering if you're visiting. Let me just say this. Any given week, if you're visiting with us, I want you to know that you're sitting beside many other visitors. So if you ever wonder why maybe visitors don't talk or people, members don't talk to you, uh, just know there's a lot of visitors we have with us. We are thankful for all the visitors. Uh, and let me tell you this, the table is open for visitors. The only difference is uh, you need to be a believer. Uh, you need to have, have, have trusted in Christ. And this needs to have been applied to your life by faith because of Christ, or it's going to be like where it'd be like my kids wearing a wedding ring. They can wear it, but it really symbolizes a reality that's not true. So I want to encourage you to, to, to consider this. If you, if, you, if you trusted in Christ, feel free to take it. Uh, if you have not yet trusted in Christ, uh, come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about, about trusting in Christ, more about that. So I just want to say that before we begin.
<clears throat> the Bible reads in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul writes, For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given things, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I ask Brother James, will you pray for us as we partake of the bread? To take and eat in remembrance of him. The Bible goes on to say, in the same way he took the cup also and also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we take the cup, as we partake of of the bread, we think of Christ's body. It was bruised, it was crushed as the nails went through his hands. As he literally took on all of our sins at the cross, we're grateful for that. And we we partake of this thinking of our own personal sins that Christ nailed to to the tree. Colossians saying, having taken the decrees and a certificate of debt, which was against us, having nailed it to the tree. So we praise God, we thank God. And so I'm going to ask uh, uh, Brother Bob, would you pray for our, uh, our text? Take and do it in remembrance of Christ. And the, <clears throat> the similar cup and similar wafer we all take reminds us that we all are in the same need of Christ. There's not a person in the room that does not need Christ as much as you do. No one needs him more, no one needs him less. We all need Christ. And we're thankful that the, the cross is sufficient to pay for the sins of all, anyone who will call upon him. He will in no way, John 5 says, he will in no way cast out. So if you've yet to call upon the name of the Lord, my prayer today is you will see him as lovely as your sin bearer on the cross and that you would call upon him and then recognize that he's been drawing you to himself out of his love for you and that you would have an incredible, eternal love relationship with Christ. That's our prayer as a church for every single person in these doors. So let's, let's go to the Lord and thank Him for this, this wonderful celebration as we begin to look at the Word of God. Father, we thank You for this time, and we do praise You that we get to be a part of the new covenant. God, we thank You for Your promise, God. You say You will write Your law upon their hearts, and God, You will put the fear of me in them so that they will not turn from me. Oh, God, if we didn't have the fear of God in us, oh, Lord, we would all turn from You. God, we would all turn away ultimately from You, and we'd be eternally lost. And we'll be so confused. God, we thank you that we're not wandering sheep. But we are so grateful that we have a good and great shepherd of our souls. God, thank you for rescuing us. And God, we we do this all in remembrance of you. This day is about you. And God, this cup and this bread, it's all about you. And God, let our minds, uh, uh, attention, our hearts, affection be set upon you. For the rest of this worship service, be honored and glorified in Christ's name. Amen. I'm not sure if Connor's had enough time to do surgery on my mic or whoever has it. <clears throat> so I hopefully will be able to preach from this. 
but I will feel somewhat handicapped. Think it'll work? Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24. It does sound better, maybe a little bit louder, but is it okay? Let me pull up. Okay. Yeah, y'all don't need to hear me breathe. Here we go. Luke chapter 24. This is our last sermon in the book of Luke, as far as I know. And uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, just uh, I have learned so much from this book. I, I taught Sunday school for seven years uh, before I began preaching. And uh, we preached through, or I taught through the, the book, and as I taught through many other books, but uh, this is the first time I've ever preached through the, through the Gospel of Luke, so I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, studying and preparing each week, and I, I hope you have gleaned something from the messages. Uh, if you have, it came from the Lord. If you didn't get anything, I, I'll take the blame for that. Uh, but this has been God's Word we've looked at each week, and so I, I trust that, uh, I, I hope and I pray that you will read your Bible similar to how we've preached through the book that you will start in chapter 1 of a book. Put, pick If you're not reading a book of the Bible right now, let me just say this. If you're a Christian, you're being a disobedient Christian. And I don't mean that in a condescending way. I'm just saying that you, if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you, and I can assure you, the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus and says, get to know Jesus. And you cannot get to know Jesus without reading Him. And, and so I, I say that in deep love and mercy, like don't miss out, you have one life, don't waste it, pick a short book, pick one, pick Philippians or Colossians, it's got four chapters, it, it literally takes you two and a half minutes to read one chapter uh, of those books, read it, ask God to show you who he is, what he, what he believes, what he expects, what he values, and then say, God, this is written to your people, I'm one of your people, how do I live, how do I believe, how do I think? And so I hope you apply the, the, the format of going through books of the Bible to your own personal time and that you will glean, you will walk with the Lord in such joy and adoration of Him that you will be glad that you, you did that. So the last sermon in Luke, we, we began Luke by Jesus is coming to earth. Now Jesus has always existed. He is the eternal God. He, uh, he prays in John chapter 17. He says, restore to me the glory I had with you before the world began. So Jesus existed uh, in spirit before the world began. Yet at the fullness of time, uh, Galatians 4, 4 says, God sent forth his son to be born to a virgin. So Luke begins with, with the virgin birth, his coming, and then now we look today at his going. As a matter of fact, Jesus says in another place that it is for your advantage that he go away. No one in this room has ever physically seen the Lord Jesus. And you say, well, I, you don't ever feel alone about, about that. Don't ever feel like something's wrong about that. That is the way that the Lord Jesus has designed it. He says, it is for your advantage that I go away. Because unless I go away, he says in John chapter 16, verse 7, if you're taking notes, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It is for our advantage that Jesus is not right here beside us physically. As one, one preacher said recently, that uh, Daniel turned me on to a guy talking about the ascension this week, so I listened to some of his sermons, and I, he made a wonderful point. He said it's better that Jesus be above us than beside us physically. And so he, he, he does exist. He's just not here physically. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is on his throne ruling and reigning, and Hebrews chapter 7 says he is interceding or praying for us, for his children, for his people. So he is living, and because of that, it is an advantage. As a matter of fact, it says in John 14, 12, he says, uh, he, he, says he who, li- who, who believes in me and the works I do, greater works will he do because I go to my Father. So again, we're not talking about greater in the sense of quality. Because no one in this room has ever physically raised the dead. 
None of you have caused those blinded birds to be able to see again. None of you have caused lame to walk again. You can't do that. So he's not talking about greater in quality, but it's greater in quantity because it's the Holy Spirit of God who works in us and through us to make Jesus real to ourselves and to those whom we witness to, whom we live among, hopefully, as we walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. So those are the greater works. And we're going get, to get to see today, though, how that plays itself out in this last section of Jesus ascending to the Father. So he came, he lived a perfect life for 33, roughly 33 years. Uh, he, he, he taught well, he, he preached, he, he shared uh, intimately with, with those God's truths. He shared with the twelve, he shared with the three, he shared with the, with the, with the thousands. And at the end of his life, he, gave, he had opportunity to recant, to claim he was not the Son of God. Yet he said, I cannot deny my Father. I always do what pleases him. He goes to the cross. He dies a sinner's death in the place of sinners. He's buried. On the third day, he's raised again. Now, after he's raised, he actually is raised and then comes back to earth for 40 days and makes his appearance. Now, some of those things we'll read about today. Uh, other things are written in, in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Matthew. If you want to read some other things that happen in those 40 days. But we're at the end where he's about to ascend into heaven. So they physically see him ascend into heaven. The book of Acts, which is also written by Luke, starts off by saying he will descend, come back, the same way he ascended in glory. And so he will come back. But there's a time period between now and then where his Holy Spirit does his work and makes Jesus real to us. So we're going to look and see how he does that. So I'm going to read beginning in verse 36, Luke chapter 24, verse 36. We're going to look at his blessing. While they were telling these things, he, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they, were still, while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are, are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, use it to, to humble us, to teach us, to train us, to encourage us, to comfort us, to correct us, admonish us. God, we need you, and God, we need your instruction. God, we need a passion for your word and your truth. God, would you fill us with a desire for you and a desire to apply these truths to our lives. We, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. So as we imagine what is going on here, uh, can you not picture Jesus about to ascend and, and blessing them with his hands raised? Now, we are not, uh, I don't, not that I know of, there's not any Jews in here, Orthodox Jews in here. And I know you're not a first century Jew, but if you were a first century Jew and, and someone began to bless you as they're about to leave, you would think of the Aaronic blessing. And you have probably uh, heard the Aaronic blessing. It was commanded by God for the priest to pray over God's people. And he, he, acts, he tells them to invoke the name of the Lord, to bless them. And so he says in number six, speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. So they would say that repeatedly every time they would meet in the temple. It, became a, uh, it probably became so repetitious that there was a temptation to memorize it and say it without thinking about it. You know, sometimes we do that with old songs. We, we sing songs that we know by heart and we don't even think of the words. Uh, and so we ought not do that. They were not to do that. They were to think about this, this blessing. And perhaps, I would imagine, Jesus pointing to himself as the ultimate and the greatest, and the fulfillment of the high priest, possibly didn't say, the Lord bless you, what would he have said? I bless you. I will keep you. I will shine my face on you. And I will be gracious to you. And I will lift up my countenance on you. And I will give you peace. Because how did he start the whole, this whole section off? Peace be to you. So this, and, and a matter of fact, if you, if you read, that there, there, a lot of Old Testament Hebrew scholars have looked at that blessing, and they say that the crescendo of that blessing is that two things stick out, is that it says repeatedly, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. So he is obviously the source of blessing. But the crescendo of that is that the last thing God gives is peace, shalom. He gives, and that peace is, you've probably heard preachers before, if you've been in church long enough, they try to describe peace. And they're probably right. It's not just the, the, the absence of storms. It's the, the ability to rest in God in the midst of storms. And that's, what, and that's the picture of peace. It's wholeness. It's wholeness. I, I would say I, I like to think of it like a puzzle. Okay, so you, uh, I'm not a good puzzle put together person, and so that's why I don't do puzzles. Because I, I might be able to put the edges around, then I have a, just a big fat hole. And Excuse me. So when I put puzzles together, I, I get bored, I get tired, I'll move on to something else. But when you put puzzles together and you start to work on pieces of that and you start to make them fit together, uh, you know, you may have to walk away from it because you have a lot of empty spots. You know that frustration of I can't figure out what goes here and there. And, and listen to me. So there's a difference between the puzzle being complete and you've got everything in its spot. And then it not being complete where there's empty spots and you got loose pieces. Okay, listen to me very carefully. Your life before you meet Christ, you got a life. I mean, you do things, you, you got an agenda, you got you maybe have responsibilities you gotta fulfill. And so you can put those pieces of the puzzle together. But this is the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. An unbeliever will have so much turmoil in their heart because they can't figure out the missing pieces. They can't grasp it, they can't control it, they can't figure it out, and they can't trust God for tomorrow to do it. And so it, it tears them up, and they hide behind their fears with great defensiveness and possibly anger and superiority and arrogance. But it's all a big fat front to say, I don't know the pieces of the puzzle. But peace, wholeness, shalom is a gift from God that says, you don't have to know all the pieces of the puzzle, where they all fit. You don't have to know all that. You don't have to know tomorrow how it all fits together, or the next week, or the next. You don't have to know that. But the gift of peace is a wholeness in your heart that God's got it figured out. He's already got the pieces imagined there. And as you're clinging to Him, He'll work it out. It is, literally is a peace that surpasses, it goes over, it, goes, it surpasses understanding. That's what it says in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Pray that he will give you a peace that will surpass your understanding. That's what he's giving them right here. They don't understand. I and mean, they are literally an emotional roller coaster. It, it, are you picturing these disciples like I am? They're startled, they're frightened. And then verse 1 says that they're, they, they could not believe because of the joy and amazement. I mean, what? How do you describe that? I mean, you have, that's like like ten emojis, right? Like, what are you? What is going on in your heart? They are all over the place, and you can probably—I know I can relate to them. You have those emotional days where you're up and down and all over the place, and you don't even know why. Well, welcome to the club. And, and so they—they they have their own troubles, and they are confused. They're startled. They're frightened. They're thinking, what in the world? Gee, why, this is a spirit. What, what is going on? And Now, it's not just a spirit because Jesus said, look, there's flesh and bone right here. And 
and he ate a fish. So he eats fish in their midst, so which gives us a lot of hope about heaven, right? So I hope you like fish. Jesus ate fish in his glorified body. I hope, hope you like fish. I know I do. So he eats that before them, and, and so the point number one, his, his peace calms a troubled heart. It, it truly does. It calms the emotional roller coaster of their heart. Um, he gives peace. He, he is peace. And when Christ fills your heart because of his presence, that, and when I say that, you say, well, I thought Jesus was on the throne. Well, a lot of times when we talk about the Lord's presence in our life, we're really talking about the Holy Spirit who makes Jesus real to us. Okay, it's the Spirit of Christ, and how I don't own, understand how all that fits together, okay? You find somebody who can totally and absolutely, fully, ultimately explain the Trinity, they're God, okay? In other words, no one can. But all I know is the Bible teaches that when Jesus ascended on high, he sent us Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit applies the truths of the Bible to your heart, to my heart. There's a reason why I used to, I used to hate being in church, and I used to hear people preach to me, and I hated it. I wanted to get away from it. I didn't want to, I did not care. I didn't want to hear what they had to say. Now, how can all of a sudden I want it? Like, I want, I want truth. I see my great need. I, I feel so impure before God. I feel like I'm, I'm hopeless. Now, on the outside, it might look good, but, oh, I'm hopeless on the inside. Why is that? Like, how do you just wake up to that one day? Because the Holy Spirit of God is applying these things in my heart. Applying those things in my heart. And you say, well, how? Why? I don't know. All I know is John 3 says he goes where he wants. He's kind of like the wind. But praise God he came. Because <laughs> I would still be stuck and trapped. I would have never recognized my need and wanted God. But I want him. And the, and the Bible says taste and see that the Lord is good. And so some of y'all have just began running your Bibles this year. And it's so fun watching you because you've tasted and seen and the evidence of taste and seeing is your life has changed, but you want more of it. Like, where does that come from? The Holy Spirit applying those desires in your heart. You say, well, I'm not there yet. Start right here. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. We give away about one a week. So we, we would love to give you a good study Bible so you can understand the Bible and just, just let the, the Spirit of God apply these truths to your life. It's, it's awesome. Let me tell you, I, I'm so thankful to be in a church where, I, you know, Connor stops the, the, the actual uh, instruments, and you just hear this voice behind you of all the God's people singing. But this is what makes church great, <clears throat> is I've only been here about two and a half years, so I don't know you all like I hope to know you in five or ten years. But what I do know of you, it just re it rejoices my heart to know your stories and then know you're singing these songs and know that they, they have such meaning, and I know they have meaning in your life because... You and I believe the same truths. We believe the same God, and we're rejoicing in Him. And so that's, that's the joy of church. And if you're, you know, some of y'all have been here a long, long time, and you ought to just look around and say, I'm so grateful for the people I've gotten to know in this church and minister to in this church, and I hope that always has such a meaning to you. Like that, you will carry that for eternity, the people that you have ministered to in this church. And if you're not ministering to people in your church, you are missing out on rewards in heaven. You're missing out on blessing right now, but you are missing out on great reward in heaven. We'll get to those rewards in heaven when we get to 1 Corinthians uh, over the next few weeks, months, years. <clears throat> but the good thing is that God imparts peace, but he also, his blessing imparts joy. So, again, I don't fully know, understand what's going on over here in verse 41. Okay, I'm just picturing it like, so it says that we, while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. <laughs> how do you even, I, I, just, I just trust, I don't understand that verse in its totality, Lord. I don't, help me to understand it. I'm trying to understand it. I'm thinking like, like I thought about, like uh, 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 hung out with, uh, with the Brooks last night and I was thinking about Brock. And so Brock plays first base when he's not pitching. So what happens if, if Brock is, on for, is, is playing in the field and the pitcher throws the ball and he blacks out? Okay, he blacks out, he can hear, but he can't see. And he hears the, the crack of the bat, and he throws his glove up like this to protect his face. And sure enough, the ball lands right in the center of that glove, and he squeezes. And what's his, what's his emotion going to be? I mean, he's going to be shocked. He's going to be amazed. He's going to be gratefully joyful because it didn't smack him in the face. 
But I, I just picture all these emotions going on like, what this could have been, I thought we were about to all die and we were going to all be crucified. I thought we were all going to, we were never going to have any hope. We wasted three and a half years of our life following this, this useless, quote, Messiah. And then now he's here before us. And so it just, just changes everything that Jesus appears to them. And they have joy. And so it's like they can't believe, they, if you, I bet if you interviewed them at that point, they'd say, we just can't believe this. They're overjoyed and they're amazed and they're excited. But it's just, it's so unbelievable. Because this, this was not in their, their thinking. It wasn't, I mean, it was predicted. We see it in the scriptures, right? But the, the and this is what goes on in our day too, the, the common notion of the day of what the Messiah would be like and look like did not fit the Bible. They thought he was going to be different. Thought he was going to deliver from Roman oppression. Uh, he's, as, as we said in Sunday school, we thought he, they thought he was going to be a divine Superman. He's going to be the Batman. He's going to come in and wipe out all their enemies. And just, he was going to come and pick up all the Israelites and put them on his shoulders and carry them around town and say, these are the, the champions right here. I, that's literally what they believed. They had no room in their thinking of a spiritual Messiah who would physically, physically rise, but that would defeat the enemy of sin and death. And they didn't have their, in their thinking. Now they did after they sent the Holy Spirit. And so we get to that next. The mission of God is guaranteed success because Jesus has ascended. And I, to clarify that, because Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit, there is success, guaranteed success at God's mission. Now look, we look and say, well, of course, experience and, and testimony shows that. We see that the Word of God is going out to all the nations now, and, and we've got people from uh, well, there's nation, tongues, and tribes that have called upon the Lord that, that we've never met. There's nations and tongues and tribes that called on Him that, that was generations before us and could possibly be generations after us. But why is that? It's because the Holy Spirit of God that came at Pentecost, He is still convicting hearts and applying truths to their lives. And He's still doing that to missionaries that say, I must go, I must share. So the, the promised spirit empowers the believer to witness. Look at verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. You are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And so the Holy Spirit of God has, has clothed us now after Pentecost. We live after that. And therefore, <clears throat> uh, because of that, uh, the, the, the witness has been given. Uh, the Holy Spirit has put the witness in our heart. Therefore, we become witnesses for him. That word can also be martyr. That's the Greek word, is martyr. So as mar Christians were martyred, they gave witness. They gave testimony of who Christ is and was, and they, they sealed it with their own blood. So that's the witness of that. Uh, and I think I skipped a point uh, on point one. The temple becomes a place of praise. So instead of a, the temple being a place of just sacrifice, and it had become mundane. It, be it became in the, if you read Acts 7, the way they treated Stephen, as they, they said, listen, this guy's coming and bashing our temple. And, and even the prophet said that, woe to those who say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. There's a, there's a great woe in thinking that once you walk in the temple, you automatically have God's blessing. You can go live, you go live for all the other gods and, and bells and, and asterisks outside the temple, but just, you know, at least you got God's temple, you walk in there. And, and, and so it had become a place of, of business. So the temple was, a, was primarily a place of business at that time. That's where the, the priests made their money. They had their, 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 their sacrifices, and you had to buy from them, and they would charge exorbitant prices. That's why we try to make sure that the church is not a business. The only time it's treated as a business is when Jesus is overturning tables. So we want to make sure the church is viewed as a body, where Christ is our head, where the hands feet. We're just vessels. We want to view the church as a flock where the Jesus is our great shepherd. And we want to view the church as a family. We have a heavenly father, but then Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, says young men view younger women as sisters in purity unto the Lord. View older women as mothers. View, uh, younger men view, view older men as fathers with all dignity and respect. So there's a way we view each other but the temple had become a place of lifelessness. But not after the Lord ascended, not after he sent the Spirit. What did it say they did? Verse 53, 
They were continually in the temple praising God. They remember the curtain had been torn. They remembered what Jesus had done in that temple. He had overturned the tables. And they remembered, I mean, all, just think, the Holy Spirit is, is now guiding them into all truth, as he said he would do in John 16. The Holy Spirit is guiding them into all truth. And what that means is the Holy Spirit is, is using this, this fertile mind from the Old Testament Scriptures, and he's now making it new. He's making it applied to the life. He's showing how Christ is the fulfillment of the temple. Christ is the fulfillment of the sacrifices. And so, again, they're, they're going to church with a whole new attitude because the Holy Spirit of God is filling them. And, that, that, again, I think of it, when I was growing up, I, was going to, I hate going to church, but it was because I didn't have the Spirit of God in me. It was just me. And just you and, and the things of God, you're not going to want the things of God. So they could go to the temple with praise and adoration for the Lord. Uh, let's go back down. I apologize for getting out of order. <clears throat> So the Holy Spirit, the promised Spirit, empowers the believers to witness. And I'll say this, without the Holy Spirit, preaching the gospel would be in vain because people would never care. If you were, to, No matter how clever you are, it doesn't matter how good you look, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, it, doesn't matter, it does not matter what you know. If you share the gospel with somebody and the Holy Spirit does not apply that to their life, there's nothing you can do. You are powerless. The, the Lord says, I have no needs. If I did have needs, he says in Psalm 50, I would not even ask you. He says in Isaiah that the nations are but a drop in the bucket. They are dust on the scales. Now you say, why are you talking down to us? I'm not. I'm just saying this. That your significance and your, your statute compared to God is little. It, you, you need God. He does not need you because you're so little. You're so nothing. Thank, but thank God for grace. He would come after nobodies and those who are, who are filthy rags, as he says. And he would say, look what I will do with a surrender soul. Look what I will do when I transform their heart. And so, as Paul says, you become trophies of grace, he says to the first Thessalonians. So you become, you become, look what God can do. <laughs> and now, again, it does, it's not look what God can do and I can praise myself, but it's, it's how, how well can you magnify God in your life? How well can you point others to the glory of Christ, the glory of His grace, the glory of His peace, the glory of His truth and wisdom, the glory of His long-suffering and perseverance? Do you walk with those characteristics of Christ? If you do, it's because the Holy Spirit of God is pouring out His grace in your heart to do that. And He's demonstrating to you, look what I can do. And He's demonstrating to others, look at my peace. Look at my comfort. Look at my love and compassion. And, and don't you want Him to say, hey, look at her. That's where you see love and compassion. That's where you see a woman who perseveres through trials. When you see that, that's what I mean by you're seeing the glory of Christ in their lives, it's because it's not them. It's Christ through His Holy Spirit. So the message, <clears throat> the message of salvation is for all the nations. Look at what He says in verse 47. So Jesus said in verse 46, It is written, Christ will suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So and you say, well, I thought the gospel was about faith. Just know, when the Bible talks about repentance and faith, it's really two sides of the same coin. The faith is the positively turning towards Christ. You see Him as lovely. You want Him. And, and, and it's, it's a gift from God to say, wow, I want God. But the repentance is, it's, it's, like, it's like if you're trying to get married, okay? Let's say you're going to get married, and you got uh, two guys that's after you. you got two girls after you, okay? You can't, and you're, and you're, you're the lucky guy or gal. You're having to pick which one. Okay, you can't pick both though, can you? Repentance is literally you you seeing the lovely, the most lovely one, or the one you're going to marry, and when you turn your back on the other woman, because you're turning your face towards the one you're marrying, like you have to turn your back on one, or you're betraying the other one. That that is repentance. It's literally turning your back on self 
and sin, as much as you know how, I'm not saying a perfected life, but the direction of your life becomes Christward. So you, you're, you're pursuing Him. You're pursuing His Word. You're pursuing to know Him through His Word. And so uh, it's for all the nations, not just for the Jews. You see, the Jews were given the task in the book of Isaiah, they were to be a light of the nations. But they failed. They failed miserably. Not only did they allow the nations to impact them and make them you know, worship the bells and the gods around them, they began to practice their, their ways and their customs. And so because they became like the world, they had no influence in the world. You say, well, I guess the promises of God have failed. That's, some, that's Paul's argument throughout the book of Romans. Paul says, may it never be. Because God sent the perfect Jew who is, who was, and who is the light of the nations. And that's why he still wants the gospel to go to all the nations. So Jesus Christ, working through his people, shares with the next generation and the people next door and the people over there the message of salvation, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's our message. And you could add, you could add from this scripture, add the fact that, hey, if you... If you'll see Christ as lovely and repent, turn to Him in your life, He will gift you with His Holy Spirit to live in you. It won't be you, it'll be Him empowering you to love Him and to serve Him. And you can't do that on your own. You can't clean up your life by yourself. The Holy Spirit of God will do that in you. And then last, God still opens minds to understand Him. <clears throat> Verse 45, He again reminded them, as he, as he went from the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he says he opened their minds to understand the Scripture. That is an incredible promise for you and I today. Because, number one, I think everybody in this room speaks English. So you're blessed in that way. Some folks speak a different language, and there's not yet a New Testament in their language. Thank God he's sending missionaries to, to, to work on language learning and work on translations, and we're, listen, we're working with uh, the Tishamangos who are in the Congo, and, and there's, pla- there's people, groups, and tribes near them that do not have a Bible in their language, so they're telling them the stories of the Bible now, they're relaying that, which God can use to save them, they're, they're sharing the gospel message, but they don't yet have the scriptures. You and I are so blessed to have the scriptures. I hope and pray nobody in this room has dust on their scriptures, or, you know, some folks like to put their Bible in their, you know, in their, they used to put it in their, in their car, you know, right above the back seat. And uh, I took a lot of groceries out to folks that had that Bible up there. And, of course, it would be all dusty. And, you know, I'm assuming they get it out every Sunday and take it, to, take it in church maybe. I don't know. I know we have multiple Bibles. I would just say this. If you are not spending time in the Bible, you are really missing out. Um, so please, please, please. Like I said, start with a small book. Start with a small book of the Bible and go from there. And, and read, read, I would say get a good study Bible so you can understand the context of why the writer is writing that book and maybe some of the, the themes that are in that book. And, and I would say this also to any unbelievers in the room. If you're an unbeliever, then <clears throat> number one, you have to face this. Are you willing, if Jesus is God, are you willing to submit to him and honor him and worship him as Lord? Because that right there shows you your heart. If you're not willing, it's like, yeah, I can see most all cultures besides Western look at the world, and they they never even have in their language the idea there's not a God. (laughs) Because they can view God's invisible but powerful and intelligent attributes through creation. There, There has to be someone before you There has to be someone before you with greater knowledge and power than you to have creation. You say, well, well, how do you get, I don't, if you don't have an answer for that, the Bible gives God, the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are the ones who created. It was formless and void, and they created, put life here for a reason and purpose. It's the reason why you have a conscious, and I have a conscious, a moral, moral conscious. And so if you're an unbeliever, You will get a Bible and say, God, if you're true, speak to me. And just see what God will do. I trust God will speak to your heart, especially if you try to prove he is not existence. 
or do, has not done when he says, uh, there is something about <clears throat> this Holy Spirit that as you read his words, it's, it's unlike any other book because the Spirit of God opens your mind to understand the Scriptures. And if you're not understanding the Scriptures, then I want to say it's, the Bible speaks of helpers, teachers, to help you understand the Bible. If you're not in a Sunday school class, I would love for you to be a part of a Sunday school class. I would love to help you find one. We've got great teachers, great classes, and, uh, and I just, I'm praying that God would just continue to, to grow the church through, through small group learning the Bible Sunday school. Or we, we have some small groups outside of the, the Sunday morning uh, hour to, to get in those groups and learn and how, see how other people will help you understand the Scriptures. It will change your life. It will literally change your life. Because I guarantee you, you you've got, if you're saved, you've got that figured out through Christ. Uh, now, the sad thing about many Southern Baptist churches is we make such an emphasis on salvation, as we ought to, but we do it to the detriment of the rest of the Christian life. So we, have, we birth a lot of babies and then tell them, good luck, thanks for getting our numbers up. That's what we, that's, I, don't, I don't like doing that. That's why we do a new members class. We want to help disciple you because if you only understand justification, you're going to walk around like a baby who has no answers to life. But if you begin to walk with Christ in His Word, this is what will happen. You will still have tough days. But when you have tough days, and you get alone with God, and you not only read His Word, but as you pray and think, God, show me from Your Word how I should think about the situation. It's there that the Lord proves Himself, and the Holy Spirit proves Himself as one who guides you through the Scriptures. Because He will guide your mind back to things you have read and learned and memorized. Children, it's not coincidence that we want you to memorize Scripture. It's because as you memorize Scripture, that is what God reminds you of. The Holy Spirit reminds you of His truth when you need it. How does that work? Well, just this week, going through tough times. Hebrews 13.5 came to my mind. It says, the Lord will not forsake you. It says, it says, be content with what you have. The Lord will not forsake you, for He is your helper. What shall man do to you? When, when God brings that verse to your mind as you're praying, it's, just, it's peace. It's the missing puzzle in your life for that time. And, and I would love to counsel anyone going through tough times. Look, let's think of the Scriptures that God may be wanting to apply in your life. And that's why... Biblical counseling is supernatural counseling because it takes the, the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit of God applies that to your deepest heart's need. And that's what I love about counseling is helping you to see your heart need. Sometimes we don't see our heart need. We see our presenting need, our presenting problem. But when you see the heart issue, because every heart issue is met with Scripture, when you see how it works out, there's no way to explain it except for God gives understanding the Scriptures and that is peace. And that is what carries you. That's when all life can be pouring down on you, and you walk free with contentment and peace and calm because the Lord is your helper. The Lord is the completer of the peace that you need. So the message is for all, and God opens minds. And so how can we apply this? Number one, we need to rest in His Word and His promises through all life's storms because His words are not empty. They're not empty. I saw a, 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 a video one time with this guy, and he, with all good intention, he was going on, and it was a video that you watch, and he was telling me how wonderful I am, and, and all these things to encourage me. The only thing is he didn't know me. It was just a video. And so you're supposed to watch that, and I guess believe those things. But it was all empty words, because I didn't know him, he didn't know me. But the Bible's not like that. His words are not empty. He knows you. He knows what you need. He knows what you need to hear. So when He speaks to you, it's to help you at that time. He knows you. It's not empty. Next, you need to ask God to open your mind as you read your Bible. Ask Him. Number three, you ought to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins to any and everyone who will listen. Jesus begins and He ends His earthly ministry preaching repentance. Therefore, we ought to preach it as well. And then last, we ought to trust in God's empowerment for His glory as you obey Him, worship Him, and joy and praise like the disciples did at the temple. This is the blessing that Christ comes. He bestows that 
on, on all who believe. And so if you're here today, you are a recipient of this blessing. And if you need to trust Christ, let they, today be the day that you say no to self and yes to Christ. If you want to know more about that, I would love to help you. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much, Jesus, that you are the blessing of God. You are the one who makes truths real to our hearts. God, you're the one who convicts us of our deep sin and our need for a Savior. God, you're the one who shows us that our paths are crooked, that our end is destruction. God, you show us that our need is for a Savior and that you are the one who saves. God, thank you for being real to us. Thank you for, uh, for giving us these truths. God, help us to worship you uh, because of that and help us to go to the nations, uh, beginning not in Jerusalem, but beginning here in Lewisburg with the gospel and going out from there. God, help us to be a part of that. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.